little bit about, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Jive, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit of story about my work at Jive, because I think it's a good way to kick it off, all right? Um, so Jive is a company we've been around for about four years. Uh, we started out as a job board, um, and then about you know, three years ago, we pivoted. In like the classic kind of early stage startup sense of the word, we pivoted. And the job board was getting a lot of traction from a lot of big companies. So companies like American Express and Accenture were posting their jobs on this job board. And so we were meeting with them on a regular basis and talking about them about you know, what their challenges were and, and, and what, their, what they needed from companies that they were working with and they were partnering with. And they said, you know, it would be great if we could get some tools that worked on top of our ATS because our ATS just doesn't really do enough of the things that we needed to do for us to meet our recruiting goals. And so the CEO of our company, a guy named Joe Essenfeld, said, great, we, we could probably do that. So we, we hired some, some more software engineers, and we built a social referral tool that went on top of, of uh, Accenture's ATS. And then they said, you know, about 25% of the people who are coming to our career sites are actually coming in on mobile devices. And we think this is going to be something that is even going to be more popular going forward. But I'll tell you right now, the, the ATS is a terrible, terrible support for mobile. And um, Joe said, in the room, the, the guy who was running talent acquisition and him took out their phones and they started looking at um, the mobile experience for a candidate. And it was basically undoable. You, you, you basically could not apply from, from, from their phone. It was just impossible. And we could talk about all the reasons why it's almost impossible for most enterprise ATS systems to actually apply for a job on there. Uh, and so they said, Joe said, we're going to fix this problem. So we fixed it for a couple of clients. And within like two years, we have like 50 of the biggest companies in the world who use our mobile apply solution. So basically what happens if you go on American Express or Accenture or Comcast or Microsoft or a whole bunch of other companies and you're on a mobile device and you go to apply for that job, we detect that you're on a mobile, you leave their ATS and you literally come over to a service that's hosted by Jive. And what we're really focused on and what we're really passionate about is how can we create like a consumer level experience? I see everybody's almost literally holding their phone now, and I know I can guarantee you that every single person in this room has a mobile device with them, if not more than one. Admit it, who's got more than one with them today? Right, we all do. Um, and so this is the first year in history that people will spend more time, the average US internet consumer will spend more time browsing on a mobile device than they do on a, on a computer the first year in history. This was from some of the research stuff that goes on. And the apps are amazing, the experiences are amazing, but yet if you go to apply for a job, it's literally undoable. The, the process was designed to be done on a computer. Right? Think about that. The process was designed to be done on a computer. It assumes things. It assumes you have a keyboard and a mouse. It assumes you have your resume stored locally on some hard drive, even though we all know that on a mobile phone there really is no local storage. Right? So we're trying to solve this problem for these companies. And the second part of this conversation is around how mobility is impacting analytics. Right? And the numbers are really amazing. Um, so Comcast is one of our clients. And they, in 2013, they literally did no, they took no inbound job applications on mobile. Zero. And this year they'll do half a million through job. So just think about that. That's, 500,000 extra applications that they, that, they, that they did. And that's interesting from a pure volume perspective, but what's more interesting is that now the performance of people who are coming in on a mobile device and the performance of people who are coming into Comcast careers on a desktop computer are literally the same. It's the same user experience for those guys, which means the same application conversion rate, which means the same amount of dollars that you're spending advertising and all those types of things, they're actually the same whether you're coming in on a mobile device. And so I found that interesting, and I was talking to Raul over at Valent Valent Raul Valentin at Comcast, and he told me something that I'll never forget. He said, you know what's really amazing? God bless you. What's really amazing is, is that a third of the people out there, their only internet device is mobile. If you don't mind, I'll add sure. to that. And that especially 
That especially applies to the emerging markets. So, for example, in Latin America or in China, the number of people that are on mobile devices is exceeding, exceeding the number of people that have a PC at all. Yeah. So, uh, this is the only way, actually, to find a person if you are looking for someone in the emerging markets. It's a perfect dovetail to the story I wanted to tell, all right? So, um, so I've worked at Jive for six months. I come from the enterprise IT space. I may have told some of you guys that last night. Um, and so, you know, uh, I came into this business not knowing HR and not knowing really the, the technology space that much, but I knew enterprise software and, ha and how to market people. So um, I needed to immerse myself in. So the very first conference I ever went to was ERE in Chicago. And so uh, going to the big keynote, was anybody at that conference? ERE in Chicago? So uh, I went to this big conference. It was a huge conference room in a hotel, and there was you know, 500 people there. And there was all these amazing speakers up there, some inspirational. And then there's, this is what did it for me, like a, to truly understand the space. It was like this guy from Adidas gets up there, and he was in charge of employee branding for Adidas. So he was like my age, but he was dressed like a 20-year-old. Like he had like, like neon green Adidas sneakers on, and he had like a backwards Adidas hat on. And he showed all these amazing videos like of people in Adidas gear, like, you know, playing basketball and soccer and running on the beach. And it was like, a, it was amazing. And I was in the audience and I said to myself, huh. And he was talking about like activating the Adidas brand in places like Sao Paulo and South Africa and Israel and all these, you know, not as perhaps technology evolved societies as the one that we, that we sit in. So I took out my phone. I was like, huh, I just wonder, right? This guy's talking about activating the brand in South Africa. I took out my phone, and they had, when you go to apply for a job at Adidas, and you hit that apply button, it's out of the box success factors, and it is unusable from your phone. So I don't know how much money that guy was spending in South Africa, but I can tell you this, it was wasted money. It was all wasted. No one could apply for a job. You could activate the brand as much as you possibly wanted. Right? And to me, this is what really the light went on for me. This is after I took the job, right? After I agreed to, to join Joe in this mission, I realized that we're, we really are on a mission now, right? We need to help, we need to save corporate America from itself, right? The world has moved to mobile, but their systems haven't, right? And that may, may not be forever, but for the next few years, we have this really unique opportunity to do this, right? Um, so I, I just was wondering, has anybody ever applied for a job on a mobile device here would be the first question. Has anybody ever thought about applying for a job on a mobile device? And what happened? It doesn't work. It's amazing, right? Now, how many other business functions do you think don't work on a mobile device? If you think about the market that we play in and really kind of where we think there's a huge black hole is your students are going on Indeed or, 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 or some of these other job boards in there and, and they have mobile apps and they can go ahead and they can apply for jobs right, right through there. Um, but that's, uh, you know, uh, but what about the students that you have who want to go work at Google or want to go work at Apple or want to go work at Facebook, all right? And, and they click on that link and, that, and, that, and it takes them to their career sites, right? Those guys are doing it on, camp, on campus from their phones and they're unable to do it. And that's really the, the problem that we're trying to solve for. You know, we all shop on Amazon, right? So imagine, like I just want to put this in context of like why I think the apply process is so important, right? So imagine you were at Amazon, like I use the Amazon mobile app all the time, right? And so you search, it's a really great search. I do my search, I find my product, I do my comparison, I read my reviews, I hit one click to buy it. If you don't, it, it, like it's weird, like we tell clients all the time, like you need to think about the whole process on mobile, not just the front of the process. Right? Because imagine if Amazon asked you, when you go to do one click to buy it, to stop and go to your PC. Like they would never do that, right? And, and because it doesn't make any sense. But if you, because a lot of people say, well, well my, my career site's been, has been optimized for mobile. Like, okay, that's great, right? 80% of the people want to do some of their search on mobile, but 75% want to apply. And those are numbers that we surveyed. So Jed, who works on our team here at Jive, he runs a survey every single year. Um, we, we, we interviewed a few thousand people about, about their behavior. 80% of the people expect to be able to do some of their search on, of job search on mobile, but 75, almost the same amount, expect to be able to apply. But yet we're asking people to stop and go to a PC, right? It's, it's amazing. So, um, 
Uh, I'm Stu Ags to Ribby. Uh, uh, previous four years worked with Burson and Associates, indentured servitude to, to, to Deloitte when we were sold to them, etc. Uh, so, curiosity question for you, because especially on the process and the continuation and what you were saying, Amazon doesn't make you go back. Tell me, uh, I'm really curious to learn. So, the applying process, obviously, there's the upfront, but let's say I'm going to be a call center operator at you know XYZ Corporation. So, they want me to take a pre-hire assessment test culture fit, personality fit, whatever the hell it may be. How does your system help can keep that mobile experience going through that so I'm not being forced to go to my PC? Yeah, so th there's, there's two ways to do it, right? There's two, there's two ways that we do it and it's a great question. One way is we take the chicken way out and we just opt and we, we, we just schedule and you have to go to a PC to do it. And we do have some clients who do that. But now there's some assessment vendors who are optimized for mobile as well and so when the, the client of ours says, what assessment vendor should I use? We recommend that they use a mobile optimized vendor. We have a short list that we give them because we've actually pre-integrated with them, which means that they're more modern technology. They have an API that's easy to, for us to connect to. Um, you know, the, the world has changed. And if, and if you're using modern technology and modern APIs and you're optimized for mobile, it's actually quite easy for you to get that stuff integrated. It's vendors who don't do that and who haven't built the, or have legacy tools that don't have APIs and are not optimized for mobile. Um, we typically ask them to go offline and do it, right? It, it's a very akin to the resume problem. Like, um, uh, so if, you, if you're on, you know, any one of the number of sites that we, that we provide uh, uh, solutions for, one of the first questions, obviously, is upload your resume. And so um, and on an ATS, it assumes that that resume is local to your machine. So we give you a couple different options. The obvious ones are you can log into a cloud drive, so OneDrive, Dropbox, Google Drive, whatever your favorite cloud drive is, we integrate with all those things so that if the consumer, the job seeker, has his resume stored on one of those cloud drives, he clicks on the button, he authenticates himself against the cloud drive and uploads his resume. That's an easy one. You can use LinkedIn. We do a social sign-in as well, so you can actually use your LinkedIn profile and suck that in as a placeholder for your resume, and we parse that all for you. That's a good way to do it. Everybody would want to do that. But then we also came up with this other way to do it, is if you've ever... If you've ever emailed your resume to somebody, right, it's probably on your phone somewhere, in somewhere in an attachment in a sent file folder somewhere on your phone. Um, so we create a temporary email address and say just email your resume to this email address. And you basically go in and you forward that email off to that temporary email address and it attaches it to your resume and those things all rationalize up on the back end for us. We, we actually take that and pass that back up. So making that easy because we figured out all the different ways that people could actually have their resume on a mobile device. We've thought through all of those things. So we give you all those options on the mobile apply process because we don't really know. But for those vendors who can't do it, it's a disaster. I sp have spoken with a lot of companies that uh, have tried to move their process to mobile. Yes. And the, some of the things that they have chosen, some of, the, some of them chosen a path, not having apply button at all at their website. It's basically you are scrolling through the career site and you are looking for interesting jobs and w you only have one button, which is show interest. Just express interest and it's like you click on it, you basically upload your LinkedIn profile in a snap yep. and that's it. It's absolutely seamless. What about that? Is that yeah. possible? So we love that process, right? We love that. Um, so we've developed some technology that's for talent networks, which is basically what we're talking about, right? Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's more of a talent network. Yeah. So... Um, I think that the, the challenge really is, is that a lot of the large, again, our focus and our view of this is the large enterprises, right? That's how, that's how the companies that we sell to. Um, but, you know, they're so process centric and changing those processes is really, really hard. Now, some of the reasons are because of compliance reasons and, and rules and things like that. There's, and laws that we have to follow and, and you know, maybe unfortunately sometimes, uh, so they can't. So what they're doing is now there's, there are a whole bunch of new approaches which are changing the process. Now, they're not, they're not eliminating the apply process there. That person who applies to your job, who, who shows interest, is now going to get an email from you, and they're going to have to go through an apply process eventually, right, sure. for compliance reasons. But um, you, you can improve the conversion rate, which is, which is part of the, the whole point around some of these analytics. Exactly, that but about. That's, that's about perception, because yeah. you're not applying, you're just joining the company, you're just following it on LinkedIn, yes. on Twitter, or whatever. No, so typically the clients that we work with are using the talent network more um, separately from their own social network, social profiles. So um, they're on a mobile device and they say, just join our talent network, right? So you click on the button, you're in mobile, you, you, you create, now you still have to do some 
create a username, create a password, typical type of things. Um, you can use your LinkedIn profile for, for some of that stuff. Uh, and then that actually just goes into candidate, candidate, kind of a candidate marketing system on the back end. Um, and I think what happens now is, what's really cool is, um, the clients that we work with who are optimized for mobile, what they're doing is they're sending the person a, 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 a link, and it says, if you're on mobile, click here. Right? And it sends them back so they can actually complete that mobile process. I think the real challenge, especially for the, uh, the generation that's coming up, um, the younger generation of workers, is that mobile is the internet for them. And I think this is the real issue for that, that's going to be going on. Is like, th it's no longer there's mobile internet and then there's the kind of computer-based internet. Mobile is internet. I've, I'm old enough to have teenagers, and I'll tell you right now, they, if you can't do it on your phone, you just can't do it. And, and I, I think that's going to be the way of it is. And, and even more, you know, we, we go back and we track all the people who get jobs on our system through these. So when we track you all the way through the hires, it's weird though. What we've seen in the last few months is that the skew of jobs is actually trending more um, to the high end. A lot of it was higher level jobs now are also applying. For, so it isn't just, when we think of people applying for jobs on their mobiles, it's not just millennials. Right? It's actually people now, we're starting to see that become more standard stuff that's happening inside of uh, uh, even white collar jobs now as well and skill oriented jobs. I, I think what you guys do is fantastic and the fact that you're putting that front end on there and I've just been applying an American Express just to see how, <laughs> how it um, happens just from that perspective. But I think one of the things we, we in the talent acquisition industry, Kara Garnot, I'm a consultant in the space now, but 17 years leading TA at a variety of Fortune 500 cool. companies before I left and did my own thing. Um, and one of the things that we, we continue to attempt to do is just move a little bit inch to the right or the left and make the existing bad process mobile enabled, make it existing bad process a little more automated <laughs> instead of truly thinking about, because I mean, here I am on the American Express site and it still wants to know what my GPA was as an undergrad sure. and that was almost 20 years ago now. Um, and so you know, why are they asking me that up front yeah. and you know, really thinking about the process? The fact that I can do it on my phone and type it in is great, but you know, I think that that's part of the challenge with where we're going with technology is we're not stopping and saying, what, what are we trying to achieve? Instead of just saying, oh, compliance reasons. Now I've worked for for federal government contractors, so I know compliance, but I also know you can get around it in a lot of ways sure. if you're creative and still produce that. So that, that's where the challenge comes in. I think for where people stand now to have a tool like what Jibe offers is, is a great next step, but I think it's just mobile enabling a crappy process. I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and here's the thing that's really amazing, right, is so when you buy Jibe, you get, um, we, we, you know, we, we, we take your existing process and we, and we optimize it for mobile. And we run that for you. Um, and since we run it, right, we now provide you the analytics. Right? So every one of the Jive customers can now has a URL that they can actually go in and they can see what's actually going on with those, with those candidates. Um, so this is a question I ask every time I speak anywhere. What percentage of people who start an online job application actually complete it? It's a good question. What do you think? How many? It's way lower. It's way lower. It's way lower. People who start. So we, we, so we, we casually are, you know, we, we look at a cross section of about 30 or 40 companies. We think the answer is like 10 or 15. We really do. People who start an online job application and actually finish it. Seriously. Even for cool companies with awesome employee brand. Even for cool companies with awesome employee brand. It's like 10 or 15%. Right? There's knockout questions, right? There's, there's a whole bunch of reasons why that is. So the companies that we work with, right? And by the way, we, we'll even optimize your desktop process as well if you want, because uh, it's pretty crappy as well. We'll make that a lot better. Um, but uh, if you think about it, for the clients that we work with, it's like 10 or 15%. Now, the, some of the clients that we work with have raised that up into the 40s or 50s, just by making it a better experience. But here's the really amazing thing about that, is we have this chart. Um, that we use in our own internal analytics, because then, so last year we did three million job applications or something like that we processed, some big number like that. Um, there's a direct correlation between application conversion rate and time on site. It's literally a linear plot. It's amazing. 
And then when we show, so what we, so it's a weird thing though because we don't own the data, right? I mean, we do, but so if we've taken a job application for American Express, it's American Express's job application. So we can't really munge it all together with, you know, somebody else's data and, and, and it makes some. So what we do is we show the independent individual plot points. And what we see is for those companies who now take the analytics and say, geez, hmm. 16% job, you know, I'm spending a lot of money to only close 16% of my, of my job applications, right? That's a terrible number. So what they do is they start looking at the process. And they're saying, okay, and for us, we give you really granular details so you can see exactly where people are falling out of the process, right? Which, which is weird because this is like standard stuff. Like, as a marketer, here's what's interesting. As a marketer, Google Analytics gives me for free, right? Like I have a demo on my website that I want people to go because I, wanted to see, I want everybody to see how awesome your mobile experience can be. Right? So I have a demo on my website. There's six steps in the demo. You can run it online. I know exactly who they are who comes to my website and I know exactly how far they get in my demo. Right? Yet people who are owning an enterprise ATS don't know where they're dropping out of the apply process. So now with Jive you can. So you say, geez, if I'm losing 60% of my people in this spot, what if I move that to the end? Uh, it, it, it's not a software issue, okay? It, it's, it's, it's a best practices or a leading practices issue, okay? Uh, having been, you know, a recovering ATS person myself with years at Taleo, okay, and, 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 and being a hiring manager for large IT projects for many years before that, what you're talking about is doing a candidate experience audit. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're mobile, it doesn't matter if you're traditional AP, ATS, it doesn't matter if you've got kiosks at Target and people sitting down, it's candidate experience audit. It kind of ties a little bit to what Jerry was talking about before. Sure. And it's really about a leading practice and then understanding the bottlenecks, be it mobile, be it, be it pen and paper for God's sakes, but what is stopping it. And that's just something, God, I almost hate to call it inherent laziness but it's something organizations, especially large ones, don't do. So I'm, I'm more optimistic about people than that. I am. Um, so maybe I'm, because I'm a marketer. I'm a marketer. Uh, I have to be. And when you work in marketing, you have to be optimistic about people's uh, innate sensibilities, right? So um, as a marketer, like I'd say, we use analytics every day. So Jed works for me. Jed, how much do we use analytics? Every day, every You know? We know everything. We know everybody in our database. We know when they come through our website. We know what they're doing on our website. We know what behavior looks like. We live it. We breathe it. We go and we talk about analytics to um, talent acquisition professionals, and they go, hmm, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. But, but that's not of, analytics. A, that, that's, that, that's a basic, basic, it, it's fundamental reporting. What you do with that it turns into analytics. But what we're talking about right now is just a simple analysis of if I have eight steps in my candidate application process, regardless of whatever it is, how many get to step one, how many to get to step two, how many get to step three, and then just you're doing very elemental regressions, just saying, so, where, so where, why are they stopping I'm at this step? I'm going to challenge you one, one bit on the, just on that, right? Yeah, and and because I think it's... I, uh, and by the way, you, were you here yesterday? I'm, I'm in the spirit of Taris. What he encourages us all to do is push back. Push back. <laughs> so, yeah, so, but here's the one that blows my mind. I get that. It's a simple look. I can look at a pie chart, and I can look at a, a plot graph and say, Everyone drops out at resume upload, we should fix that, right? Or some other, or this knockout question knocks everybody out, we should, we should, we should move that to the end. Like exactly. This one blows my mind, okay? So we also do a lot of job distribution for clients. So you, if you wanted to post jobs on different job boards directly from your ATS, we, we have some automation technology that helps you do that. Um, so we posted millions and millions of jobs for these big companies. So we get all the data back. And we give you a, a, a really cool looking dashboard. You can even look at it on your phone that says, how are my engineering jobs doing on Dice versus Indeed versus Monster versus anybody else, okay? Or even some local sites. And we give you that, that data. So we can show these people with one click from their phone that these particular jobs do best on these particular job boards and they don't move to spend. And what's the answer? Why do they do that? There's a data, they can look at a pie chart and say this particular set of jobs is underperforming on this job board. I gave the answer before, but he didn't like it. It was about people being lazy. <laughs> I don't think, so it's weird. I think that the answer we're finding more and more is, is that they don't, they don't have the sensibilities to trust the numbers. They're not analytic people. Recruiters are people people. 
right? We keep hearing this over and again, and we're not analytic people. We're, and you probably have a comment I'm thinking about this more than, more than, more than, more than most, but we find that a lot of people in, in the enterprise accounts that we work in are telling us we're people people, we're not analytic people, and so therefore, this is a foreign language to us. It might as well be in, 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 in Greek. Marketers 10 years ago were all people people, right? We were touchy-feely color of the website people, but now, right, we were, right, 10 years ago, but now we're, we're marketers or data scientists. <laughs> We're both saying the same thing uh, because, you know, in my book, if you don't want to learn something new, what's the root cause of it? So yes, yeah. uh, sure. Say, potato, potato. I'll agree with that. You win. Uh, definitely, I would agree with that. There you go. I hadn't thought of it like that, but yeah, sure. Well, a question to the audience: Who here has technical education? Something connected with numbers. So that as simple as this. I mean, most of the 99% of recruiters have. Hum like something that, that is not technical, that has nothing to do with numbers. And as what we, sh like for example in our company, um, in the recruitment firm that I worked for for many years, uh, basically what we found that recruiters who have technical education and background in physics or math have the best performance among others. Hmm. And they're much more analytical, they're much more able to leverage technology in that processes. So maybe the answer is to move uh, from political science, history, literature to hiring uh, technical people for recruitment, and that's how you would create that data analytics culture in your organization. I'm again being very evil because most of you are liberal arts graduates. Very optimistic. Great. You might disagree. Uh, university. Uh, that's okay. And, uh, okay. you know, the president of our university wants to know are our students getting jobs? Are they getting it through, your, through our sources? Uh, everybody is interested in the bottom line in analytics. That's all we're doing is producing, re not all, but a major part of our work is for showing, you know, producing reports that show our efforts have payoff. So it's not soft anymore. And do you think, do you think, do you, hold on to that because I'm going to answer your question. So um, the people who work in your organization, right, so they're, 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 they're that's the, they're more in the, on the recruiting side of the, of the, of the thought process. Do you feel like they're they are adopting these methods? Do they believe the numbers? Are they, do, they, uh, do they absorb the, are they trying to do continuous improvement? Are they trying to move the needle on the numbers? Do you judge yourself? Do you have these MBOs? You, it's definitely coming from, from the top of our organization because we want to show, you know, they want to know because people come to our university to pace and we have to show, you know, the more people come to PACE because they get jobs. Sure. And so, there's, you know, so it's, it, they have to adopt it or they're out. We turned over our staff quite a bit because our counselors weren't necessarily, you know, more interested in giving information and getting results. Now they're more interested in getting, you know, the, the results are, are, are really very, very important. So uh, my boss, is, is constantly work, uh, I'm producing reports on the, on the results and I don't like them. That's one of the reasons why I'm here. You know, because like, I think there's a, like what you're doing, I, I want to talk to you afterwards. Um, you know, I, I can't get anybody to, to uh, put a mobile app in there, you know, you know, so people can get jingles when, they're, when there's job matches. Yeah, yes. And so, so, and I know it's going in that direction. They're not going on websites. And, you know, we believe it, but we, you know, we just have to make those matches. Do you think, do you, how much time do you think you guys are doing pulling reports? Um, let's put it this way, I, I spent f three nights this week starting at 7.30 in the morning and working to 9 o'clock at night producing reports. What is the, av we did a survey, what do you think the average talent acquisition person, so let's say they work in talent acquisition operations, so they come some kind of managerial <laughs> view of, a, of an enterprise talent acquisition shop. How much time do you think they spend a week Pulling numbers. You're not allowed to answer. You know no, the answer. Numbers, numbers or reports. Reports. Yeah. It's 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 a. It, I, don't, I shouldn't talk into that again. You should hold that. Uh, you know, I mean, I forget. I forget the exact number. What was it? A week. Thirty-two hours a month, just pulling reports. Well, crazy. That's probably just standard reports. Then you have the CEO comes and asks you something crazy. Yeah, you then you then the ad hoc and things you don't even know. 
the it is the most measured function in HR, and you should have that. But I want—I do want to go back to Taris's point as well, because I do think we have, um, as a humanities undergrad, I take offense to your statement. <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> we'll also point out that I realized I was lacking something and went and got an MBA because I wanted to stay in the space and be sure. able to have a, a, a business focus on it and um, went to an analytical undergrad school nonetheless. That being said, I think the point really is, and it was made yesterday as well, we, the bar for getting into recruiting ha is low. I mean, I don't even know what it is, to be honest. I mean, I, I wrote a post, none of it, nobody, uh, nobody ever said I wanna be a recruiter when I grow up. You fall into this by accident and you're either good at it or you're not. And if you're not, you can, fly under the radar for a really long time at a large corporation and it doesn't really matter. And as talent acquisition leaders around this circle and wherever else, I think it's incumbent upon us to think about what makes a good recruiter, the background, like I wouldn't know a piece of code if it hit me in the head. However, I am an analytical person. I can get through the statistics. I can look at those things. And even why are we not, why are there not curriculums at universities? They have HR degrees. Why are we not looking at recruitment and talent attraction and, and, and melding it with marketing? I mean, I think there's just a lot of things that we're missing. I mean, my marketing class and classes in my business school program taught me more about how to do my job as a TA leader than any else I ever took um, and so we're not we're not partnering in the right place to grow that next generation of people who can be really skilled at this because I mean it's it's not rocket science so, I mean, so let me let me let me ask the question this let me ask the question yeah. this way so if you go every company on the planet uses salesforce.com right let's just whatever the high, high degree of probability that is and if you go into salesforce.com you see a list, list of sales reps what their target is and what their performance for the year is it's a standard report, every SFTC comes out of the box with that, right? So I'm a rep, I have the New York Territory, my quote is $2 million, mm -hmm. I've sold 1 million, I'm 50% of my goal. Mm -hmm. In our app, right, our analytics application, you can go in and you can say, look at all the recruiters and how they're doing on KPIs, mm -hmm. right? What recruiters are, 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 have, are, you know, have what their open recs look like, what their time to hire is, what their time to fill is, all those types of statistics. You can even look at it per class of job and how those recruiters are doing. We, our clients ask us to turn that recruiter capability off. Why? Okay, well, I'm asking you, we don't know. Okay, okay. So, we ask them because, because it's too much. Okay, so they don't know what to do with the data. Well, and because, come to my session later where I talk about the stupidest uh, recruiting metrics ever, and time to fill <laughs> is number one on that list, okay. so please join in. Um, but it's because we don't, they don't know what's truly driving the business, and they're not looking at those things, and I would say all those things you mentioned are really not that great at determining whether recruiting is, is truly impacting the business or not, and we need to think about that differently. And honestly, we're not very good in HR as a whole is about measuring our own people. We want the line to measure people and you know put them on pips and do all of those things, but we're not very good at doing it ourselves. Yeah, we're terrible. We're, we're the worst, yeah. you know, I mean, I went like six years of my HR career with never getting a performance evaluation, but you know, <laughs> you know, you, we pound on the line to make sure those things happen. So I think it's that those, those KPIs, they know in their gut, they're not the right ones, yeah. but they don't know what are the right ones. And so that's where that challenge comes in. So, so having done consulting into organizations on the back end of Taleo implementations, I mean, you know, so again, recruiting the most dissected, measured, analyzed next to maybe call centers in businesses, all right? So time to hire or time to fill, all right? Aside from the fact that most organizations can't have a common definition of what it looks like, <laughs> all right? Does it begin when I say I want someone? Does it begin when finance approves the budget? Does it begin when the actual rec goes out? Sure. And then... Okay, fine, so now you have time to hire statistics, but they don't tell you anything because you don't understand why it took so long. Was the bottleneck with the hiring manager? Was the bottleneck because they didn't know how to interview? Was the bottleneck because somebody's cousin was going to take the job so they didn't want to talk to anybody? It throws, it, it makes the data, I hate to say this, almost useless because there's not the ability to dive behind it to actually get the true root cause analysis of what these high level data points are. So, I mean, sad to say, way too many organizations have the ability to have this data, but because they don't know how to use it, they'd rather not look at it, which is sad. So, so where do you think the, um, so I, I, I want to hear your chalk, chalk, by the way, that'd be great. Um, but 
So where do you think those, where, where do you think the standardization of these metrics is going to come from? Where, where, because there, there's, in a lot of industries, they've rationalized this, right? They come up and said, this is, the, this is how we're going to measure people in this industry. And, but where is that going to come from? I mean, I feel like we have really strong industry trade groups that, that should be doing some of this and driving some of this, but yet we don't really see it yet. And I just wanted to get a feel for why we don't have that yet. Why, why is the def, and the one that drives me crazy is, is application conversion rate. So at Jive, we really care about application conversion rate. We tell our clients, if you use Jive, you know, you'll do significantly better on application conversion rate. And by the way, we define it as percentage of people who start an online job application actually complete it. That's a good, solid definition of that. We have competitors who says, we have 90% application conversion rate. By the way, their definition is <laughs> setting up a username and, and password yeah. is an application conversion for them. Well, it's about having a I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, so where is that? Where is that going to come from? Who, who's driving that? We would, I, I, that's something that I, I just feel passionate that like, we should be doing as an industry. What I was going to say before was, um, I'm Dominic, by the way, the recruiting manager for ZocDoc, which our company's based on an application to make you know, consumer's life experience quicker, faster. Why do we do anything online? Why do we do anything mobile? We're New Yorkers, we have limited time, we want to do it fast. Sure. What you're doing by simplifying the application process through mobile, I want to be able to do it fast. I'm on a ferry, I have 20 minutes, I want to look at something. <laughs> I can't, I get to a certain point, I can't upload my resume, I stopped. Yeah. What you're doing is it's the candidate experience. I think the simplification of it will make people go to mobile faster if sure. they know they can do it like this rather than having to go through that whole long process of being on an actual PC. Yeah, yeah that's exactly it. And then um, there's also like, a, just to put a fine, one last point on it is there's a bunch of studies now that are coming out that people find, people find that mobile phone, mobile is more personal than a computer. It belongs to you more. You, there are some people, but we don't wrap them in, in like personalized things, and we don't put, change the backgrounds as much, and we don't love them as much as we love our phones, and so it's a much more personal experience. And especially for people who are passive candidates, they find that applying for a job, especially for a passive candidate, is a personal experience. So you're much more likely to do a personal thing on a personal device that you have some affinity for. That may be deep psychology, but that's a bunch of studies now are starting to talk about stuff like that, how the, the personal phone is much more personal. Right. Can I get back to like what you said because I'm a bit shocked. Did you mention that some of your clients want to turn off the yeah. performance yes. sort of tracking yes. function inside the application? Too much. Seriously, that that, that <laughs> just shocked me. Like for the whole, I will I will tweet it like after this session. Well, because I again for, before that I worked uh, for a com for a recruitment company, executive search company, and part of our culture was we adopted the methodology from the book called War for Talent. And basically, what it implied is that every year you fire every half a year actually you fire lower twenty percent of your stuff of your performance, and that is so. <laughs> sure, you'll talk about it? Awesome. So N Stu is actually up next uh, talking about uh, the EOGL organization and performance management. So like for me, it's inside my blood to like be able to track performance and to be able to get rid of a, o o bad people and f promote the good people. So, so it's here, very strange. Here, here's the perspective that I tell all clients that I go and uh, everywhere I go, I, I go talk, I say, the good thing is there is some good news here, right? The good news is, is that we're at the 10 yard line in the world of analytics in HR. We really just are beginning. And I think that's why we should all be actually walk away from this optimistic, right? Because at the minimum, we're having this conversation where a few years they weren't even, the tools are evolving so much faster than, than, they, than they possibly can. Um, and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, this is why, you know, we, we're doing something interesting and I, I wanted to make sure everybody knew it is, so we've launched this thing called the Data Driven Recruiter, uh, which is, it's an online portal um, anybody in this room, you guys are all interested in HR, you're all interested in analytics, you can come, you can guest blog, you can write, you can reply. What we want to do is we want to create a place where people who do this for a living can talk about this, right? And, and we can all get better, and maybe as a way to do that. So follow the Data Driven Recruiter, check out the Data Driven Recruiter, the Twitter handle, it'll take you to our online portal. It launches on Monday. Uh, we've got a bunch of people from the industry already working on it, so Charney's working on it. Our first guest blog is Tim Sackett. Um, so anybody wants to come write a guest blog about their experiences with analytics in, in talent acquisition, come and you can write a guest blog. At, you're all welcome. Aki, you can, anybody who wants to come guest blog, you're more than welcome. All right? Because I think if we, if we get that content out there right, and we educate people, then we'll get the ball to the 20-yard line.
and then maybe we'll, you know maybe 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 next year or the end of this year we'll be at the 50 yard line, right? And then and then I think we'll see some more advancements as we go. But I. I, I think we should all be optimistic about it. Well, I completely agree with the optimistic point and want to go back to your question earlier of kind of, you know, who's leading the, the change yeah. of, you know, the quality. And there are, there are things going on. You know, if any company is a member of the corporate executive board, you know, they have their talent advisor program that has very specific metrics and data. And a lot of companies are adopting that. And it's regular surveys and regular scorecards for their recruiters. And again, it's the more forward thinking folks. Um, Jerry had mentioned earlier, I do a lot of work with the, the conference board, which would be con co considered a competitor to CEB, um, but in a different way. But there I actually lead um, their Council of Talent Acquisition Executives. So I have 45 VPs of TA of Fortune 500 companies. I get together with them in person three times a year. And I can tell you, these are some of the smartest, brightest, analytical thinking people. They haven't gotten to the role of VP or SVP of talent acquisition by accident. Um, yeah. and, um, and they really want to make a change. And one of the things, our next meeting is early March, and one of the things we're embarking on as a council is kind of setting that, setting the bar for what is the KPI you really should, the KPIs plural, that really should matter when it comes to recruitment, not just recruiters, but your organization as a whole and kind of, and conference board publishes those kinds of things. So putting that out. So later this year, hopefully you'll have the, the massive thinking of those 45 people, but it is going on. Yeah. It's just, I mean, there's, there's thousands and thousands of us out there. We're not all going to be, there's not the best financial planners in every <laughs> No, definitely either, not. So, you know, so we, um, at Jive, we have this, uh, one of the things we started was a customer advisory council. So we took like a dozen of our best clients. And there's like famous people in the industry. So Chris Hoyt's on the council and Raul Valentin from Comcast and these really, really smart guys and really, and we spent a day in New York a few months ago and the topic was analytics. And we just talked about it and we got one of those, I don't know if you've ever seen these like uh, visual summarists. They write like these big whiteboards and they draw these cool pictures about the conversation that's cool. Um, what was amazing about the conversation, so it was like, it was a full day and we just talked about analytics. One thing that was sure is there was, 12 different companies, in the, and they're 12 of the biggest companies in the world, not two people agreed on anything. Jerry's laughing in the back, by the way. Nobody agreed on what the KPI should be or how you should present them you know, or, or, or how proactive you should make them. I mean, one of the things that we're working on, right, is if there is industry benchmarks around, let's say, application conversion rates or how long it's taken to fill a particular requisition, um, and you're falling below some delta, why wouldn't we alert? that recruiter and say, you're falling behind, you need to do more, you need to spend some more advertising dollars, go out and promote, talk to the hiring, whatever the right answer is. And they're really, we couldn't really agree on how we would actually do that. So I think there's still a lot of disparity, but um, I, I still am optimistic about analytics in the space. I think we have all the right, um, we have all the right uh, kind of components to make it a really powerful thing. We have a lot of data, which is a really cool thing. All right, we have, we have the vendors who are really investing in the space, um, and I, I, think there's, uh, I think there's real ROI to be gained and, and, and captured. So th that, th that typically is a recipe where I think a lot of industries have found that you, you can make a lot of headway. So I, I am optimistic. Are you aware that NYU Polytech started a master's in uh, HR analytics? I did not know that. Uh, awesome. Yeah, um, NYU, right? NYU, I'm, I'm the chair for university relations for Sherman, in New York, so I kind of work with a lot of the HR student communities. Cool. So I'll be happy to share that with you. Awesome. I need to speak before that group, and I can get a whole bunch of them together. <coughs> I would love to, yeah, absolutely. Yes, tell me who you are. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Rich McDowski. I'm an HR business partner with AXA. Um, and ju just to go off that, I'm actually a graduate out of NYU Poly, and it's, it's actually part of the Master's in Organizational Behavior cool. program over there. So they started doing, um, I believe it's called Human Capital Engineering. So a lot of stuff on HR analytics. Cool. Um, I'm going to call it advanced analytics instead of big data, because I hate that word. Yeah, me too. Um, so they started doing a lot of that, because we all know HR is going towards the analytical side. And as I listen to all what we're talking about and the people who are hiding their analytics, it's because I, I think... 
I, as we kind of turn over, and I don't mean this from an age thing, as we turn over the generation in HR, a lot of people who are more into the softer side of HR and the, you know, let me let me just coach you and I'll do pips from time to time and make sure, you know, I, I'm like a pseudo EAP person inside of the office is going to move over to, to these analytics and to figuring out, you know, is it... it and I'm sure I'll learn more later for, for recruiting, um, you know, is it the amount of touch points with managers, amount of touch points with candidates, that's a better analytical type of thing than it is time to fill and stuff like that, so. Yeah, that's, I mean, like I said, I think that that's, uh, I couldn't agree more and I'm, I'm so happy to hear because I, I tell clients all the time, I think we're at the beginning of this race, like the whole 10 yard line analogy, and that just makes me feel so much better because I, I couldn't agree with that more. I think, uh, um, I hope it doesn't mean that we have to change everybody in the industry. That would be a shame, right? Because I think there's a lot of knowledge that's been built up around you know, that, of things in the industry. But uh, you know, I, I wondered if anybody had any experience with how we do the organizational change model for analytics in, in, in this business. I think that's going to be a big issue. I don't know if anybody has any experience doing it. Sorry, 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 sorry. So one of the things uh, Burson published about 15 months ago was a complete maturity model with an entire assessment anchoring points behind it around what the various stages and, and for Burson's purposes they like to use four. So you know, that doesn't mean it's the right way, it's just how they measure. Sure. So four levels of looking at uh, from 15 different dimensions what an organization, not just for talent acquisition, but all of HR analytics as a whole. What do you need from organizational strength, resources, governance, uh, what potential software or not software. Is, so there, there is a methodology behind it. Uh, and that's one, I mean, if you want to talk offline, I'm more that than happy great. to That'd show. That would be awesome. Uh, yeah. You guys kind of have access to that yeah. still, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the most mature, I think, was Oh, four. Four, yeah, uh, and that gives you an idea. And this is based on a survey of around 300, 400 or leading organizations that were willing to, you know, open the kimono. Four percent were at the highest level of maturity, and about another 11 percent were at the next level. So, you know, to to your analysis, that what does that leave? 85 percent or so who are kind of wallowing. Yeah, who who call re, who call reporting advanced analytics? Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, oh. Wow, that went way quicker. That was the fastest 55 minutes I've spent in a long time, by the way. Wow. I'm sorry. Here, give me. Tell me who you are. Uh, my name is Lance Richards. Uh, just a real quick observation. You know, when you talk about the NYU coming out with a master's in HR analytics, sure. but then at the same time, you guys, your clients are saying, turn off the analytics. So now we've got a chicken and egg situation where companies aren't wanting to see the analytics, but we're going to have all these bright, uber bright masters students coming out with skill sets that the companies refuse to acknowledge. So it'll be interesting to see what companies are the ones that start picking up these analytics master's students and putting them to work. Agreed. Yeah, or can they, can they find work? Or am I going to find them all at the Starbucks as baristas? <laughs> I went to the launch of this program at, at, at uh, NYU Polytech. I was invited. And uh, you know, Google was there. A lot of really high-powered organizations were there. They, they have a lot of uh, support. Cool. So listen, I wanted to thank everybody. Uh, this has been a great session, by the way.